Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the House of Sweden, Sweden's Embassy uh, in the United States, to talk to the Supreme Commander of Sweden's Armed Forces, Michael Boudin. Uh, it's always a pleasure seeing you, sir. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Well, pleasure is mine, as always. Good to see you. Uh, great, great seeing you. Um, you know, th there are so many uh, agenda items to talk about. First, I want to start with the bilateral U.S.-Sweden uh, relationship. Yep. Uh, you and your predecessor have focused uh, on, on expanding uh, that relationship, deepening it. Uh, there was the acquisition of uh, Patriot uh, missiles, which was uh, seen as a very big step. Aurora brought uh, American and foreign troops on Swedish soil for the first time in centuries. Uh, and then you were also a participant recently in the massive Trident Juncture, NATO's largest military exercise since since the end of the Cold War. What's next in the strategic relationship? And I also want to ask you about the three-way partnership agreement between the U.S., Sweden, and, and Finland, of course. That's an important piece as well. But let's talk first on the bilateral side of the relationship. I, I wouldn't say that there is a, there is a huge new step. Uh, we, we will continue the way we have decided together. So, so we, we, we start by the uh, statement of intent between uh, the two countries, uh, signed by Secretary, or Secretary of Defense and, and my Minister of Defense. Uh, the five areas, you know them, so we, we, have, uh, we have taken the next step to, to do it more deep uh, and broad, I would say. So uh, a lot of exercises, uh, not least. You mentioned Aurora, our big uh, national exercise last year with, with a significant footprint from uh, U.S. forces. We are heading for the next one, the National Exercise 2020, Aurora 2, if I, if I may, which will also be in the context of more civil defense. But here we will definitely have a close dialogue what content or, or what capabilities we would like to see from, from the U.S. part. Uh, just finalizing or our part of Trident Juncture, for us every single activity we do, it doesn't matter if this would be an... Uh, uh, an exercise or if it would be a meeting it's it, we need to be relevant whatever we do what it means being a small force here would be uh, not uh, not taking too much of the piece of the cake uh, being very clear what we are able to do and that's what we need to deliver every single time being the relevant partner um, what's next for the uh, tripartite uh, agreement I would say it's about the same. So, so we started out on the on the bilateral uh, cooperation, and and now we are kind of we, if not, I would say we took a step back to start all over uh, as a three part Sweden, Finland, and the U.S. And we are doing pretty good. But but I mean you can't you can't just jump in where we are bilaterally. So you need to to go back and start all over. So we take it step by step. Again, a lot of it would be about training and exercises, of course, because what it's all about is to strengthen our capabilities and strengthen them together. Um, when it comes to capability uh, development, some of those capabilities were uh, tested recently at the Trident Juncture yeah. uh, exercise. Um, it was, we're, how would you assess where you are on the capability improvement project? Uh, each one, as you said, each one of these exercises is also a self-assessment, a self-test. And the agenda was a remarkably ambitious one uh, on the part of Sweden's armed forces. Very small. After a long period of cutting, we're, you're, you're actually benefiting from some money and investment. Uh, but it's at the beginning of the project. How do you rate the capabilities improvement and Sweden's a ability to deliver relevant capabilities to a big international operation like that? Yeah. A few statements here. I, th I think you need to ask... Uh, you ask the one uh, our partners because the truth would be in the eye of the beholder how we are doing but but i know and i, I see we we are we are strengthening our national capabilities along with the uh, ambition along with the task given from from government but the re reference would be ourselves and we also need to remember that we started at a fairly low level a lot of years or a few years doing international missions now back to national capabilities. So we started out low level. We take it step by step. I see it in when, when we look at um, capabilities, how we are doing the, the wartime organization, how we work, what we are able to do. I get good feedback from partners. I mean, uh, you, you are doing good. This is really you add in these areas and we also know where we need to need to improve so so a lot of uh, a lot of 
positive uh, uh, feedback here. Uh, the uh, support from society is great. The uh, our relevance and uh, uh, the trust towards the armed forces is also growing, and and we measure it. And this is also a very good uh, uh, result for me, and something we now need to to continue to do. So we are we're taking it step by step. We need to remember, though, if we have one pace in our development, like this, this is kind of how, how, how fast we go, but the, the surrounding world is faster, are doing more, being stronger. I mean, the, the delta between our development and the other part of the world, if that is growing, that's where the risk would be. And that's not a risk from, for a military, for, for me as a, as a supreme commander. This is a risk for, for my country. Um, let's talk uh, a little bit about some of those risks. Uh, you've uh, watched Russia very carefully uh, in your career, early in your career, and now again later in your uh, career and in between as well. You were former chief of the uh, Swedish Air Force. Um, you and I, when we spoke at Lin Xiaoping at the 90th anniversary conference, you know, Russian aircraft were operating in the Baltic without transponders. Mm -hmm. As part of Trident Juncture, several of the Baltic nations have said that there was Russian jamming of GPS signals. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, that and how uh, serious a potential problem something like that is. Yeah, so, so if we go back just a few years, and I, and I mean, I, I used some, some hard words here, and, and it was it, it was mentioned, it, I mean, it was deliberate to do so, because at that time... You called it stupid at the uh, time. Yeah, b b one of the words, and, and I used others as well, because think about it, th there were SIGINT aircraft from, from the Russian Air Force flying over Baltic Sea in international aerospace, uh, mid-level, kind of bad weather, not squawking, we don't see them. And it's in the same area we have a lot of civil air traffic, so we had a couple of incidents where it was very, very close having a mid-air collision with, with a f uh, field uh, civilian airliner from Copenhagen going south to Europe. And that's when I used it. I mean, it's, it's not only about them and that they are, it's a risk for themselves. You, you risk civil people's lives. So I, I think it is, and I think it is stupid to use one word. So that was one example. We had the behaviors both uh, in the air towards our SIGINT aircraft flying very close. We've seen it towards uh, uh, naval ships out on the uh, Baltic Sea. I wouldn't say this has grown, that we see more, but often on and off it happens. Uh, and, and then we signal ver very clear, we, we, don't, we don't accept this because it's dangerous. So we, uh, we do that, we communicate it. I open up or we open up uh, for a communication line. So I'm able now to talk from my forces to the uh, to the Russian forces if we have an incident. Because if you don't handle an incident correctly and you do it uh, very careful, it could easily escalate. So, so that would be one of the, the risk right now. A lot of military presence over the Baltics, uh, meaning also the, the risk of incidents is greater than before. Then we need to be able to talk, having a, a dialogue, clearing uh, what is this, what happened. And, and uh, did you see any jamming? Was that a problem in this exercise? Um, I haven't. I haven't seen it myself. I, I know it's been ongoing, but, but I, I don't have any. I don't have anything to to comment about it right now. But this happens. Another thing at the exercise is not least tried in juncture, and this is also a new, new way of of operating for the Russians. They they declare uh, restriction areas within the exercise areas, meaning they, we, they say we will be in this area uh, from, uh, from sea level up to quite high level uh, and, and we'll do some testing, whatever it is, and uh, international water and aerospace, we can't say no. So, so it's also a way now to interfere, to be there, to show presence, and also to, I mean, to disturb an exercise like that. Um, are you satisfied with, how do you assess, um, as you said, the, it's sort of the Russian behavior is sort of no more, no less in some, in some respects, but one of the things that you've concerned yourself with is, is also hybrid operations. Uh, we saw um, Scandinavians for years have been talking about Russians buying or leasing properties and bases. Mm -hmm. We saw the Russians lease uh, the former Norwegian submarine base, um, you know, properties in Finland. Uh, you know, even Danes sometimes have said to me like, well, you know, that's kind of a curious thing. We saw Finland 
Finland conduct a significant series of raids across the country uh, against some of these Russian um, homes, I guess, with nine piers and very sophisticated communications equipment at them. As the Supreme Commander of Sweden's Armed Forces, uh, one of the, you know, a key part of uh, the security of the region, certainly from an EU perspective, but increasingly in a partner NATO uh, sort of capacity. How do you assess that threat? Is it a significant threat? And what does it tell us about the ways the Russians may prosecute a future campaign that could be different from what we think it might look like? Risk or threat or whatever it is, but, but it's, it's obvious that uh, these are examples of what the Russians now are doing in a hybrid world or, or non-linear warfare and, and working or acting in gray zones of, of, uh, of peace and, and war. And, and I think the, the most important thing is to, to have the ability to translate the situation. What is this? I mean, is, is it part of something greater? Because it's not only the examples as such. It, it glues together. This is, this is not a task that we can solve on our own from the military side. So, so what, we are, what we are looking at is to cooperate as close as possible nationally, I mean with civil society. People know things, people see things, they see when, when things change, they see behaviors, and we need to get the information to be able to, to paint the picture and also to assess an analysis uh, about what is this. And of course we need to share and, and, um, and work together with international partners. I, I think that's really the key right now. Why are they doing this? Is this part of something greater? If we're not able to do this, if we're not able to take care of situations coming up, uh, we need to figure out it's, if, is it a task for the police or, or could we act? The risk is that it, we could have a frozen conflict somewhere in our near surroundings and we don't need that. So, uh, so again, we need to understand what is happening right now. And you are pointing out a few very interesting uh, uh, things that are happening right now. Um, are some of these things happening in Sweden that you can comment on? Well, b b the same things happens in Sweden as in, in other countries. I would say uh, uh, IT systems being, uh, uh, I mean, intrusions for in IT systems. Uh, that's that's one thing that is happening. It happens to to our uh, to um, uh, industry, to civil society, towards agencies. So that would be one part. And and we we face the same challenges and behaviors as other countries are doing right now. Do you see, um, having watched Russia so closely and for so long, uh, you're a very, very keen observer and over the years have made some very, very um, um, sophisticated observations on the progression of the capability and the threat. How do you rate the progression of the threat? You know, every six months when we talk or so, uh, either, you know, for, for an interview or if we run into each other, talk to us about how that's changing. You know, there were a lot of snap exercises. We just saw the big Vostok exercise, not as big as they claim, but still very significant. Uh, you know, b before that was a pod, mm -hmm. a whole series of snap exercises that happened, even as you said, match Trident Juncture. How do you see the evolution of Russian capabilities and what pieces of it in your mind stand out as being the most worrying in some respects? They are taking uh, very clear steps forward here, building their military capabilities. We never took our eyes and ears from what they are doing over a time also when we had a more of a strategic timeout. We were focused on international missions. So we, we have a good idea where they were and how far they have come. They, s they spend a lot of economy and have done so the last few years, meaning what, when they started the transformation, the transition to, to build, you, you get the, the effect is still, even though if they should stop putting money into it, you would see a, an effect because they, it, it takes some time. So, so we see them go further. You mentioned snap exercises, big exercises, I mean, from, from where they are based, uh, gathering large units, transportation over long distances, they are capable to do that. We see them uh, operate, as an example, in Syria. They, they have taken uh, quite a few steps um, to work uh, like, uh, like we are. I mean, fast decision loops go from, from identifying something to, uh, uh, to acting, to operate. 
so, so we see uh, we see these uh, happenings, and they are they are being better. I will not go into details here. I will not giving figures or so because I, I shouldn't. But it's it's something we look careful at, and they take uh, they take significant steps forward. Um, two two questions. There is a de defense commission next year is going to be sort of charting mm -hmm. out the next budgetary future for and the strategic blueprint for uh, Sweden's forces for the coming years. Yeah. What do you want to see come out of that process? What is the kind of report you would like to see? What are what what does the outcome have to be to continue this progression of uh, improvement for Swedish military capabilities? So first of all, there is no doubt there is a broad consensus and understanding between the political parties, doesn't matter on, on what side you are, that, that we need to put more investments and budget to security and defense. So, so, so having said that, it's more like finding ambitions here. So what we did, we, we launched a report in the beginning of this year. When, when we look all the way until 2035, and with the best knowledge, experience, and as an expert, uh, uh, organization we said this this is an organization in 2035 that that we need to meet the challenges the risk the threats uh, it, it's of course it's a bigger organization than we have uh, it to be very general it's about the double size it would also be uh, be more or less a double size of, of the budget uh, from today so, so we handed over this to the to the Commission and now they work it the second report will be launched in May uh, my expectation is that they will uh, they will launch a report with uh, very clear ambitions where we need to be 2025 and 2035. And do you think that the budget support will be there? Because without the resources, you're not going to be able to do the improvement. Yeah, I cannot take anything for granted. But again, a broad political consensus that it's needed tells me that uh, uh, understanding is there and then they, they also need to to make the decision, but that has to be decided, and that's uh, uh, something for, for the future. Very last question. Um, uh, capability uh, improvement, um, the Gripen E model development is ongoing, so it's an ambitious, uh, you know, st a startling number of very big programs that are going on at the same time from a Swedish context. Indigenous uh, fighter aircraft, the A-26 submarine, you have the Patriot. Um, give us sort of a sense on how A-26 and Gripen are going, and then what are the next series of major acquisitions, whether in partnership with the United States, indigenously, or with Europe? Uh, both the projects you are mentioned, uh, I mean, both Gripen and the, the submarines are, are going along according to, to plan. The projects are, are, are running. It's high sophisticated uh, projects uh, and capabilities, meaning there is always a there are always challenges when it comes to timings, when it comes to requirements, and also when it comes to money. But this is an ongoing dialogue. But I, by, I have great hopes. We uh, we just acquired and had the decisions for a GBAD system, meaning the Patriot. That was a, the bigger, the major acquisition right now. Uh, w we do have uh, a few needs, but there are no decisions. But this is, has been pointed out in the in the report in the beginning of the year. Sensors would be one. Command and control systems would be would be another to give a couple of examples, but but that is that's an ongoing analysis and and staffing to to bring forward the best recommendation. And we're continuing our interview with the Supreme Commander up here at the Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada, uh, because we didn't get an opportunity to ask all of our questions when we were in Washington. So, great to see you again, sir. It's great to see you, as always. <laughs> so, um, one of the things I wanted to uh, ask you was uh, Trident Juncture. Uh, we talked about it earlier in the interview, but what were some of the lessons learned from that, right? It's still very, very fresh. Um, you know, what were some of the key lessons that you learned from, from that exercise and how that exercise also built on some of the lessons that you learned from Aurora, where you played a massive host uh, country uh, role as well? Yes, so uh, first of all, th this was the highlight of exercises this year for the Swedish Armed Forces. It, it, huge NATO exercise in our immediate neighborhood. So, so it was obvious that we, we wanted to participate, we were uh, invited, so the lessons learned here. First of all, we, we had the opportunity to, in practice, uh, try host nation support and how far we've come. We, we have this agreement with NATO. We had a few, or quite, quite a lot of, of vehicles here coming through the country, a few hundred from different countries. So, so that was the first part, lessons learned, takeaway. 
transportation through country to the, the area of operation, this time from Europe up to Norway. I would say uh, the greatest or the most clear takeaways for me and my armed forces would be logistics. What does it take to move uh, bigger units, uh, big military units, uh, far distances to get them to the area? And the way that NATO and not least the host nation, Norway, did that, that impresses me. They built a camp uh, in the operation area to, to take care of 8,000 troops. Not only to survive there, but to, to live there, to eat and to train and exercise prior to, to the, the live exercise. I would say that's one of the takeaways. And then down to, to my unit level, the brigade fought on, on the red side, but also together with partners. A lot of confirmations, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of lessons learned when it comes down to how we work, interoperability, communications, command and control. So uh, this was, uh, I would say, it met our expectations uh, and beyond. And was it uh, fun to play the bad guy? Uh, it's always fun to uh, to prove that we uh, the way we use tactics uh, at brigade level that it works. And and uh, we gave the other side a hard time. And we also came in as the relevant partners as we need to do. That that I would say that's the most important part. The FMV, and let me ask uh, this question, because uh, the uh, Material Administration was one of the world's most potent acquisition organizations, certainly throughout the Cold War. Times changed after the Cold War. There was a dismantlement of the organization or, or shrinking of the organization. And then logistics functions went in and went out. There's been a reformation of FMV. As the Supreme Commander, how does that reformation and the change in logistics and maintenance you know, talk to us a little bit about that reform and what it means to you as the end user? Uh, it, it means uh, it means uh, a lot, meaning that now uh, I am together with my organization. We can take responsibility for equipment, for systems, for for peacetime all the way to mobilization. That's really the the main difference from before and and it makes sense right now i mean we lived a, f a few years when when we were supposed to save money efficiency just in time but i mean what we see now in the development of the world this is something else national defense being able to to gather uh, uh, troops uh, fast and and to to have control of of equipment and so 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 that's the major change fmv will still be the procurement agency uh, so I'm, I'm the uh, I will put requirements being a good customer here go to FMV and they will do the procurement they are specialists they are very professional in doing so the complex uh, 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 contracts if I may Gripen a26 etc yeah, yeah. The, the major ones Patriot I mean economy uh, legal uh, things so, so they are they will they will continue to be the the professional procurement agency. But uh, the logistics pieces, so how many people move into your organization now because you regain now maintenance of systems but as well as the main logistics train sure. which had gone into FMV for a while before now it came back out? So the restructuring will affect some 3,500 people. Uh, 1,800 is coming back or coming to the armed forces from FMV and then we, we make adjustments in our own organization. So 3,500 will be affected and, and uh, 1800 will come from FMV to the Defense Forces. Um, just from a threat perspective, two, two last questions. From a threat perspective, do, what, is, what should Washington understand about the distances involved here? Because you know, in the United States, a two and a half hour flight is a short flight. Whereas in Europe, it's something far more dramatic. You recently visited the Ukraine. Ukraine. Give us sort of a sense to sort of focus Americans on the distances we're dealing with and how quickly threats can evolve and be right on your doorstep. Sure, we, we, we often talk about 2008 and, and the Russian aggression or invasion to, to Georgia. That, that was kind of the awakening. I would say our real awakening came 2014. The illegal annexation of Crimea, continuous fighting in eastern Ukraine, Donbass area. I, I was in, in Ukraine uh, last fall, October last year. 
It's a flight from Stockholm, our capital. It's two hours, 15 minutes to Kiev, the Ukraine capital. Same flight as down to Brussels. From Kiev, I entered a turboprop uh, aircraft, flew east, southeast for an hour. That's a shorter flight than from Stockholm up to Luleå. Then I was on the contact line, the confrontation line where it's a war going on. It doesn't, we don't see much of a reporting in Sweden, but it's very close. It's, it's, an, uh, it's an environment that looks like, on one hand, like First War I scenario, trenches, uh, soldiers in, in trenches shooting at each other. But also, on the other hand, we see, we see usage of, of new technology, unmanned vehicles, electronic warfare, strategic communication is really something that, that drives it. Cyber. Absolutely. Every day. And again, it's close to Sweden. It's close to us. And that, that has definitely had an effect and also an awareness that things could happen. And when it happens, it goes fast. Um, uh Congratulations on the TX uh, win. Obviously, Saab teamed with Boeing. Uh, big victory to supply the next trainer to the United States Air Force. Uh, at the time this was born, you were uh, chief of the Swedish Air Force. Uh, there were people who didn't think that uh, you know a brand new airplane designed from scratch from the requirement would win. Uh, you did. How does this change the strategic relationship between the United States uh, and uh, Sweden at the end of the day, right? It's a warming relationship. We talked about you know, your job uh, kind of coming in and constantly building and expanding that relationship. How does that change things? And what do you see for the future? Is this the airplane that the Swedish Air Force is gonna buy to replace its aging training aircraft that you and so many generations of aviators learned to fly on? Yeah, so first of all about relations here. I would say this is another great example of very close uh, cooperation and relations. Uh, I would also say this is, uh, as we said, a feather in the hat for, for, for our defense industry, being, being able to, together with, uh, with one of the major defense industries in the U.S., develop something from the beginning, and it turned out to be the winner. I, I think this is great. So, so uh, thank you for the congratulation. It should go to defense industry. Uh, take it to the next step then. Would this be the future trainer for the Swedish Air Force? I would say it's too early to say. We have, it's obvious we need to have a, a new platform or a system, at least, yeah, a new system to train our pilots because our trainer right now is old. It's been there since late 60s. Uh, of course, with this outcome, it's, uh, it's definitely an, uh, one of the uh, alternatives but but it's too early for me to say. We follow this very closely and I congratulate Saab and Boeing. Uh, how much, I know the Defense Commission is gonna come out next year, but is there a figure that if you could give them a number for what you need to do this massive job, how, much, how many crowns do you need for the job of rebuilding the Swedish military getting its capabilities up to the level that's going to be required from a national defense, but also from an international participation standpoint. Is there a figure that you have in your head to do this massive job? I, I, will, I will definitely try to answer. I will not give a figure, but when we, our report to the Defense Commission, our perspective study that was, uh, we, we sent that in in, um, in uh, February, we look at 2035. What we see to, to have a, a relevant organization with the, with the capabilities that we, in our analysis, says that this is what we need. I also take into account or consideration technology development. It's like a double size organization ref, uh, in reference for today. I would also say the budget would be about the double size to be able to develop it and, and also sustain operations. So, so that gives you an idea. This is, this is my best assessment to political level. How far you are ready to go, I don't know. So, we, so it's 2035, but we also look at 2025, if that would be the first step. But 2035, double size organization, about the double size uh, budget. General Michael Budian, uh, the Supreme Commander of Sweden's Armed Forces. It's always a pleasure talking to you, sir, and getting a chance to talk to you twice in two different countries uh, in one week is pretty good. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much.